Good afternoon. It's really a, a pleasure to be here at the University of Georgia. I, I mean Georgia Tech. <laughs> uh, we were just talking about that. It's, uh, it really is a pleasure. Uh, the best man at my wedding uh, got his PhD here in nuclear physics. And uh, I'd never been to Georgia Tech before, but uh, my boss in uh, Pennsylvania before Buffalo was uh, uh, the, the region for the American College of Healthcare Executives and said, uh, congratulations, I signed you up to become a fellow. And I said, good, what do I have to do? And he said, well, there's a test on Saturday. Here's an airline ticket, and I'm sure you'll pass, because if you don't, you're fired. So I remember coming down, and, and you guys aren't old enough, and uh, he, he and I were big basketball players in those days. So we went over to the field house, and we were playing basketball with, with Mark Price, which was pretty cool. And I took the exam, and, and I guess I passed, because uh, here I am. So I have a warm spot for, for, for Georgia Tech. Uh, this is my second year in, in doing this, and it's really um, my pleasure. I think giving back is very, very, very important. And so I'd ask you, you know, 25 years from now, when you're successful, I want you to remember that people came and talked to you and answered your questions and, and, and listened to your ideas. And I would ask you to pass that on because it really makes a difference. And um, I think some of the reasons for, for my management uh, growth um, was in graduate school. I got assigned to this hospital called Shadyside Hospital. And they had these lightweights like the chairman of Mellon Bank and the chairman of US Steel. Uh, on the board of directors, and I started out as, in my first job as assistant to the president working with these guys, and it really made a significant difference. So I ask you to pass it on. I'm going to give you a, um, a, uh, a presentation that I gave to Med Assets, which is actually a, a real live company here in town. They're the largest hospital group purchasing organization. They brought, bought Broadlane, one of their competitors, last week for $1.4 billion. Um, and they asked me to talk a little bit about what it's like to be Grady's CEO. And, and, and I'll tell you a little bit about my management philosophy. And, and I hate to tell you this now, but you've spent all this money for education. And management's really pretty easy. And, and we'll talk about that. Um, I have an executive MBA from Harvard. And, and I have an undergraduate uh, in biochemistry and an MBA from the University of Pittsburgh. But when I went to Harvard, about 15 years after I got my MBA at Pitt, all the finance department from Pitt had gone to the Harvard Business School. Um, so I don't know what that tells you, other than they taught us the same stuff as, as they did 15 years earlier. Um, the most significant aspect of management is your expectation. And this sounds so easy, because you're going to ask me, what did you do at Grady that's different than the other six CEOs who were there before you? And I did exactly the same thing at Erie County Medical Center. And this is so simple that you're not going to be able to believe it. Okay? How many of you want to flunk this class? None of you. Okay? You have expectations. I was at a seminar yesterday morning um, with, with uh, a Harvard Business School investment manager who's a billionaire. And he said, you know, all these young kids, and you're young kids to us old people, like my son. My son's, uh, you know, Phi Beta Kappa, graduated number one in his class, never failed anything, went to the Air Force, was a captain, started that drone program, um, and he's gone to UVA Law School and he'll graduate in the top 10 in this class, and he's going to go work for a firm where everyone graduated in the top 10 in their class at Harvard, Yale, UVA, wherever, and they've never been in the bottom quartile before. Most of you have never been in the bottom quartile before, so you don't know what it's like to deal with bottom quartile people. And a quarter of America, that's 75 million people, are in the bottom quartile. So you better figure out how to work with them because they're going to be working, unless you work at Microsoft or GE, okay? Most of you aren't going to start there. So at places that are not successful, the employees have no expectations. To them, it is a mere paycheck. 
what I've been stunned by at both of my, you know, I've worked at two stellar places. Shadyside Hospitals produced the chairman of University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, the CIO, the CNO, four presidents of their hospitals. It really was the place. It was the cash cow. Langster General, you can look it up, US News and World Report. Hicksville, USA, you know where the Amish are, okay? We took that hospital from a nice community hospital with cement walls to it looks like the Ritz-Carlton, lowest cost in the country, most profitable hospital. Those people had organizational commitment, okay? Erie County Medical Center in Grady, there was very little organizational commitment. They did not identify with the organization, and that's why I started with that little joke. You guys identify with Georgia Tech, and that means something to you. Places that are not successful, they don't have those expectations. They don't ask questions. They'll do exactly what you want. If you're in, in reimbursement, and every month you see a check for a million dollars coming in from the state that you do something with it, and you've been doing that every year for five years for a million dollars, and it suddenly jumped up to four million dollars, you do something. You tell somebody, right? Not at Grady two years ago. They just kept passing it through. And it had a very negative implication for us because no one asked any questions. Gee, this is really unusual. This normal check is four times as high. And I could see the first month, well, maybe it's a mistake. But the second month and the third month, and it ended up costing us five million bucks. There's no performance because they're not measuring anything and they do that purposefully and they become expert at dodging responsibility, dodging questions, dodging commitments, the dog ate my homework, you know, the bus was late. And we put in a, a fingerprint time card system, okay? And when I got to Grady, you could be late 16 times and nothing would happen to you. And I cut it to now you can be late seven times and you would think I've killed everybody's child. Oh, Mr. Young. Uh, and I say, I've, I've been coming to work for 30 years. I haven't been late one time in 30 years and I live in Atlanta too. And well, you don't punch in. I say, yes, I do. Okay, so there's no performance. Moreover, the company has no incentives. There's no pay for performance. There's no promotion of those people who do well. You get promoted because you know somebody, or you've, worse yet, you've been there longer, okay? And smart people figure that out. And if they know they're doing a good job and they know they're not gonna get promoted, they're gonna go work at another company, and over 20 years, your company is in Loserville. And they have no product that they believe in. Less than 1% of our employees were getting their health care at Grady. Less than 1%. Did you need to know anything else about that? Okay. So last year we switched the health plan. Dear employee, if you come to Grady, your x-rays are free. If you go to somewhere else, your x-rays cost you 50% out of your own pocket. And they screamed, Grady sucks. It really doesn't, but that's what they thought. There are big weights. And I said, but wait a minute, that's your fault. That's your problem. You work there. You fix the product. And now it's a year later, and they're actually very happy, very satisfied customers. We're paying ourselves left pocket, right pocket, instead of sending money to our competitor hospitals. And my health care costs actually went down 10% last year. Georgia Techs are gone up next year 10%. Mine's gone up zero. Okay, now they believe in the product, okay? So these are, are what happens in, in less than successful organizations. A winning organization has high expectations. How many of you would go into a loser company and take 40% of your pay at risk? Anybody? I did. And I knew I'd get crucified in the newspaper. Oh my God, he got a bonus. And my boss said, gee, I hope we have the same problem next year. And the reporter said, well, what problem is that? A $65 million EBITDA improvement. 
I'm glad to pay 350 grand for a $65 million EBITDA improvement. We now have performance measurement at every level. Last year, um, you know, we did the old Grady way. We just gave everybody a cost of living increase. This most recent year, in April, there are certain things that you have to do to, to be a nurse, certain mandatory educations. If you didn't do that, you got a pay increase of zero. What do you think happened to the mandatory classes after that happened? They immediately filled up. All the mandatory stuff is now filled up. In Lancaster, we actually start our own college because we had 10,000 employees. We had a nursing school, so it was very easy. And we put together a curriculum. And in order to move up through the management ranks, you had to take the 26 classes and pass them. And, and no one went. So we finally said, I'm sorry, I'd like to promote you, but you didn't take the classes, so you're ineligible until you take the classes. The class is filled up. We taught our middle managers exactly what we wanted them to do, and they worked well. And I turned over 80% of the management team at Grady. I told a new guy who's running my nursing home, I said, if I had to do it over again, I wouldn't have given them a year's worth of evaluation. I would have given them a quarter. So you've been ahead of a quarter. I want to know who you're keeping on Friday and who you're getting rid of. And I don't say that in any negative way, because at the end of the day, without Grady, the whole healthcare system in Georgia becomes a mess. Without this nursing home, there is no free no nursing home in Georgia. It's a mess. So I, I have to look at my obligation to 250 residents who are sick and need help versus 10 managers who've, who, who've wasted tremendous resources. And, and what's the responsibility there? And the answer is the responsibility is to do the right thing. So what is leadership? It's really very, very e easy. It's getting the right people. Okay. The first month I was at Grady, 75% of the employees who we had interviewed and, se and selected, once we did their drug test and their um, background checks, 75% of them flunked it. This is the people that we picked. So we've turned over our entire human resources department based upon the last slide, hiring people who know how to find motivated people, people who will take responsibility, people who will set expectations. And we don't have that problem anymore because now the word is out in the street. Grady's looking for strong players. Plan. You need to have a plan that you can understand and has to fit on the back of a business card. And it has to be comprehensible from the chief of trauma surgery to the housekeeper. It has to be very simple. It has to be believable. If your plan in 2010 or in 2009 was to grow real estate volumes by 25%, what are your people going to do? They're going to laugh at you. They're going to laugh behind your back. It's going to ruin your credibility, and they're not going to follow the plan. So the plan has to be real. That doesn't mean it can't be a tremendous stretch goal. When I told people at a public, unionized, governmental hospital in New York that we were going to be the leading hospital in three years, they looked at me like I'm nuts. And we're putting in a new computer system, and one of the consultants is from um, Buffalo, and I said, um, oh, you're from Buffalo. She says, yeah, my parents are still up there. And I said, well, do they go to the hospital? And she said, oh, yeah, we just got out of ECMC. It was great. They wouldn't have said that five years ago. Policies, I hate them. I've been CEO since 1988, and I have never written a policy. When I walked into Grady, we had this many pages of policies. Policies stifle people, okay? Did you ever read about the five-year-old kid who was suspended from school because he had a three-inch or a one-inch pocket knife because he was gone to Boy Scouts because they have the zero tolerance policy? Policies are for people who can't make decisions, who can't be consistent in their decisions. They will kill you. So when you go work at these big places and they give you policies, 
you can say that crazy man from Georgia told us policies aren't necessarily good. Maybe you better wait a couple weeks before you say that, but <laughs> um, policies are overrated. Here's one that's very, very, very important. You have to prioritize what your three or four priorities are. And they're not necessarily services. They're how your company operates. So at Lancaster, only two things mattered. The highest quality care in the country with no compromises. And my chief of cardiology whipped a medical record at a nurse. We suspended him 30 days because we wanted the nurses to be very energized to really control care so they could tell the doctors when they were wrong. And this guy liked the old hierarchy. I'm the boss. I'm a doctor. You're a nurse. So we suspended him. And when you suspend a doctor, they have a right to appeal. So he came to the board and he said, Mr. McElhaney, who was the chairman, he said, I have $17 million in your bank. If you suspend me, I will pull all my practice money, my retirement money out of your bank. And thank God Mr. McElhaney said, well, you do what you have to do. You're suspended for 30 days. And if you're back here again, we'll throw you off the staff. And the room got deadly quiet. He pulled the money out, and Lancaster General passed everybody because the doctors now had to participate evenly and fairly with everybody else. So our priorities were highest quality care and making money. And my hospital was the most profitable hospital in the Northeast, one of the most profitable hospitals in the country. And when I left, they had a not-for-profit hospital had a billion dollars in cash unrestricted. The pension was overfunded by 150 million and our age of plant was six. Okay. Every employee, even the nurses, they knew they had to take care of that patient and they had to do it as effectively as possible. And then practice. You must practice what you preach if you're in a leadership position because they will look at everything you do. Every employee is skeptical just like you guys are skeptical hoping I'll shut up soon, okay? But trust me, if you have a special CEO parking place and your people skills and your plan is that we treat everybody the same, they won't believe it because they treat you differently, okay? So you must practice it, okay? If you talk about fair compensation and fair evaluations, you as the leader at any level need to practice that. So if your sister is working on your floor and she's a stiff, you need to fire her, okay? Or if your friend, okay, you must practice exactly what you preach, okay? I have the same office furniture as the woman who was CEO before me. It's beautiful. It's pink. It's very nice, okay? And the only pictures I put up was a golf picture and a picture from Harvard Everything else is the same. I had the same furniture in Langster for 25 years, okay? And I, 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 I varied from that one time, and I bought myself a corporate S500 Mercedes, and I got a thousand please asks, which is a program where employees can email me and ask. I got a thousand of them. How can this be part of our cost containment? Okay, so I veered from my own philosophy because I was worth it. I was CEO 14 years. I work really hard. I drive to Harrisburg a lot. I need this big car. At Grady, they used to have a Lincoln Continental for the CEO and a driver. So five years ago, there'd be a Lincoln Continental sitting out there to pick me up to take me back to Grady. I drove, or, drove over on my own. I don't have a company card. I don't have a company credit card. So I've learned from that. So that's really hard to do especially the higher you go up. So that's review. Employees look at everything you do. Team building is more important than the books can describe, okay? The success in Lancaster was because my number two guy was five years older than me. He was very good at coming up with cutting edge program, but he couldn't run a two person bakery. He could think of how you could build a million dollar bakery, but he couldn't run it. 
So below him, I had to have somebody who was very good at running things. Okay, so you really have to evaluate your team. What I like to do is we change our organizational structure no less often than every two years. So in, in, in finance, I, I had a guy who had 15 years to go before he retired, so I actually was thinking 15 years ahead, so I developed two people below him to fill in that slot. And one was very good on the patient receivables and the billing, but had no treasury expertise. So I said, uh, Denise, you know, you're probably going to be the CFO, so you need to start coming to the pension committee. You need to start coming to the finance committee. You need to understand how we're investing all this money, because when you have a billion dollars, 1% one way or the other is a new building every year or not a new building every year. Um, when you assign just plain old teams, you don't have to pay that much attention. You really want to get the correct um, uh, specialist there. But if it's a high-level team, you really do have to think about it. Uh, if you have a team with five equivalent senior VPs and you don't think about how you set it up and structure it, it will be a failure. And the rewards, you know, our pay for performance, for me, it's 100% of my goals are team goals. At the EVP level, it's 50-50 team and individual. And at the next level, it's 25 individual and 75 team. You have to have mutual rewards, or with a month to go, your team will cut each other's throat to hit their target. I talked about this. Is it real? Can it be done in 30 seconds? If you have a planning department, your company will probably not be successful. So if you're all planning to run into planning, I, would, I won't hire you. Um, I don't have a planner. I haven't had a planner in 20 years. I think the CEO and the senior management and the senior medical staff team in a hospital are the planning team. And it has to be a natural function of what's going on. If you look at Apple, prior to Job's gone reback, lots of planning, beautiful planning. <laughs> but it didn't have anything to do with reality. And, and it's got to come out of the CEO's mouth. I don't even go to our planning meetings. We actually have them, okay? But I sit in the next room and I listen through the door because I really do want to hear what their ideas are. But if I sit in that planning meeting and I talk, then everyone hears what I say, okay? So if I'm going to have that energy spent and that time spent, I really want them to participate. And so believe it or not, that's how I've learned how to do it. So if the CEO is present, you have to be very, very careful about it. Um, and we talked about that a little bit. Policies that may reinforce it. I hate them. It's really, are you fair and consistent? And are the policies doing that? If your policy philosophy is that you have policies for everything so you can hide behind them, your co corporation is going to lose. I'll give you an example. Um, you have an employee that say she's an executive secretary and she's spectacular. And she's been taking all the courses to get her bachelor's degree and she needs one more course to go. And she's got such good expertise, you want to make her supervisor somewhere. Um, but then she, she needs an English class to graduate. That knot's even too close to work. She needs a, a humanities thing in dancing to graduate. Okay. But she does that, and then the company doesn't pay for it because it's not close to our you know, main purpose. And so you don't pay for it. You've paid for 10 grand of her other career training, and you just ticked her off over $863 worth of tuition. But you'll have a policy, and somebody in human resources will say, oh, that's our policy. It's outside the norm. And I want some senior manager to say, yeah, but, but we have a lot invested in this woman. We need her to have her bachelor's degree. We need it now. We're going to pay for it. And if they won't, then you as a supervisor probably ought to write the check, send it to HR, and embarrass them and make the change happen. Practice. Live it, live it, live it. Pay attention. Even the smallest things. I didn't think anybody cared about what car I drove, but they did. I'll give you another example. Um, my first... Uh, 
uh, of the 5,000 employees in Buffalo, the only ones who were not in the union by law was me, the CFO, the secretary to the board, my secretary, and the chief nurse officer. All the other VPs were in the union. Um, and the nursing contract was 285 pages by itself. It was unbelievable. Um, so I would come and go through the men's locker room, and there were, any of you guys ever give blood? You know, those nice <laughs> reclining chairs. And they had them in the men's locker room. And why were they there? See, you're winners. You can't even believe it. So they could sleep all night instead of doing their job. So I called up the guy who, who runs housekeeping. I said, throw them all away. And he tested me. He not only threw them away, but he threw them away on the first Friday, a change of shift. He put the big dumpster in the parking lot just as everybody was coming in and everybody was leaving, and he set them on fire. <laughs> okay? And it turned out to be a good thing because the union was in my office at 4 o'clock. Boom, 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 boom. And fortunately, I'd read the contracts before I got there, and the contract doesn't, I said, the contract doesn't say anything about sleeping on the job, and it set a tone. And I said, I'm not here to hurt you, but I'm paying you, and I expect you to work, okay? This hospital is going to close. New York is broke, and guess what? New York's broke. I said, so in order to have all these jobs and all these people that I'm responsible for, here's what we need to do. There was a night shift uh, supervisor, the guy who ran the whole hospital. I came in that Friday night. I couldn't find him. I went everywhere. Finally, the security guard said, he's out in that van sleeping. He has a day job. He sleeps here at night. So I go out and I bang on the window. And he... So we fired him on the spot. The union came in and said, you can't do that. He's sick. And I said, no, I got 30 days of him sleeping here. Let's look at these videotapes. And my county, which owned the hospital, just went bankrupt. And I said, so we'll be glad to turn these over to TV. And they said, no, you can fire them. So you really have to pay attention to this stuff. Okay? When, when the CEO of Microsoft is somewhere giving a speech like this, somebody's writing it down, and it's going to have an effect. So you really have to think about what you're doing. Mentoring. If you take one thing away, if you mentor your people over a 25-year career, you will never have a hard time getting the best talent. And I mean really mentoring them. You have a written plan. I have a written plan for my top 18 people. I have, it includes how they interact as the team, and it's really honest, and it's painful to do every year. Okay? Gee, you're a great leader, except you won't take accountability. You duck better than anyone I've ever seen. Put your name on it. Be proud of it. Take some risk. Take some responsibility. And then you demand that those 18 people do the same thing for their people, and they, will, they, they wish they were not there. But that is your key responsibility in developing your people. Whether you like Jack Welch or not, what he did at GE is right here. OK? And he developed talent early on, and they went around everybody else to the top if they were the best. And that tells everybody what's important in your organization, not time and grade. I think time and grade is, is what's killed America's productivity over the last 25 years, but performance. I was CEO when I was 32. And I can tell you now, I wasn't ready. I didn't know what I was doing, but I made up for it by working twice as hard and getting people who were twice as knowledgeable as me. So mentoring is probably the most important thing. When you get your first job coming out of here, if company three pays you $5,000 less, but that person commits to mentoring you, you go to company three, because you'll make that up in a heartbeat when your salaries get into the real zone. Okay? And ask that question, will you mentor me and will you develop me? And they'll find that very impressive in your um, negotiating skills. Risk taking. It's really a hard thing. Most Americans have lost that capacity to take risk. 
Okay, I went from a hospital making 125 million bucks a year. Brand, you know, looks like the Four Seasons, and it was boring. My wife said, "What was your big decision today? Did you buy granite or did you buy marble? What color wood paneling did you put in the lobby?" Okay, hospital CEOs are, I think, grossly responsible for the health care cost increase because we're afraid to take risk. For many CEOs, getting the job is winning the lottery. You need three or four years at 10 million bucks a year and a $40 million severance package, and that's it. So they're afraid to take risks, okay? I came to Grady, it was a big risk. Somebody had to do it, okay? And I put 40% of my pay at risk. Jim Fjord, four weeks ago, his alarm clock didn't go off, and he missed the first golf tournament. And I know Jim Fjord because I played golf with his father every Sunday morning for five years, and I know Jim. He's from Lancaster. Okay. And what did he say? Anybody? What did he say? It's my fault. I take responsibility, and we're not going to talk about it anymore. What would all the other athletes in America say? It's not my fault. It's not fair. Right? Isn't that what the average American businessman would say? Oh, it's not fair. The market changed. My stock's down. Yeah. He's a man. He manned up. And he said, it's my own fault. And then he went out and he wanted Eastlake. And he won 10 million bucks. And he doesn't need it. I know his investment advisor. <laughs> But it wasn't about the money to him. He was going to show those people what he was made of. And what do you do? What do you do to show people what you're made of? What risk do you take? What risk does American business take? You know, American car manufacturers put a little curve on it every year in the 60s, you know, in the 70s. And Toyota was coming out with four-wheel disc brakes and FM radio. You guys can't even remember that far back. Yes, cars used to not have FM radios. Okay. Next important thing besides mentoring is what I call backstopping. If you Google my career, you will probably find that I never did anything in my career. Okay. Like I didn't build the first ambulatory surgery center in Pennsylvania in 1982. I actually did. But I didn't take credit for that. I built the first comprehensive ambulatory care center in Langster in 1990. And we went from 28% market share to 90% market share. But I didn't do that. In the year 2000, if you look at the 10-year anniversary, it was Tom Paisley, my number two guy, and Jan Bergen, who's now the interim CEO there, who came up from Philadelphia to work. They got the credit for that. When something gets screwed up, the CEO takes responsibility for that. Okay? And pretty soon your people will take risks because they want the kudos. They know kudos goes with doing the right stuff. But they're all scared to death, particularly in this economy. They're scared to death to make a decision. If you let your people know you're going to backstop them and you take the risk, They'll do things. So mentor your people and then take no credit. Innovation, it's really hard. I don't know how you teach it. I can tell you I'm the least innovative person you will ever meet. I can draw at the fifth grade level little stick people. Okay, and if you give me a blank piece of paper, I'm gonna hand it back in and give you an F. Okay, but if you show me something, I can find the 500 ways to improve it, okay? So my model for innovation is I'm the biggest plagiarizer in history. And so were the Japanese in the 80s and 90s and they kicked everybody's butt. So what I'm telling you is you have to find out what your strengths are in innovation. Some people are inherently what I call base level creative. They're artistic, they can sing. You know, I can't carry a tune. So. The Surge Center is actually a place, Phoenix, Arizona. I went out in 1980, 
And I said, wow, this is really cool. I have 19 oral surgeons. And back in those days, anybody have their wisdom teeth out? Right? Y'all did. Okay. I had mine out in 1978. I was in the hospital. It was supposed to be for three days. But it was two. Um, and so I checked into the hospital. I signed out AMA. I went down to see Neil Young at the Stanley Theater with my now wife. And, you know, we had our thing. I got up, you know, got back, got up, had it out. And I was in the hospital for another day and a half. You all had them in your oral surgeon's office, right? But in 1981, they were all being done in the hospital. So I built the surgery center. And a learning moment. Um, Pittsburgh was unionized. Everybody was in the United Steelworkers. And their contract didn't even discuss outpatient care because there was no outpatient care. So I was too innovative. I was three years ahead of the market. So this was a problem because I already built it before I found out I wasn't going to get paid for it. So I went down to Blue Cross and I said, oh, this is really good. This will save you a lot of money. People don't want to be in the hospital for their teeth and their shoulders and stuff. And they said, well, how about if we just pay you the inpatient rate, which is 10 times the outpatient rate, for the next two years till we figure this out. And I went, yes. And my hospital went from making no money to making $25 million on one decision. It was innovative because I plagiarized somebody else. And it was innovative because I figured out how to get it paid. And, and, and then I became CEO not too long after that. So I'm asked as a hospital administrator, what, what keeps me up at night? And I do see a couple senior folks in the office. Um, the the, the, the health care reform is built off the back of the hospitals. And I'm not whining because we don't have much Medicare. Um, but Piedmont took a $15 million Medicare cut in 2000, starting October 1st. They're going to take an $18 million next year and probably a 20 the third year. Okay, and that's their entire bottom line. So 2015 and 16 and 17's capital plans are all going to be zero because hospitals are broke. So that's a, a, a problem if you're a private hospital. What you're seeing as private hospitals as well um, is if you're working at a company and you need your knee operated on, but your company's struggling a little bit, you're afraid to take three days off because your boss will say, didn't somebody used to sit there? Oh, it's empty. We don't need that. You're gone. And you see um, uh, voluntary or elective surgeries drop. And that's a big problem. So, so we do have a lot of those, and I worry about that. The thing that really scares me is this, because um, I was sitting in a boardroom with 10 Fortune 20 CEOs, the head of government affairs for PwC and me, and I don't know why I was there, but you would know these companies, they fly around and they deliver things and they check your finance, they, you know, your credit report here in town, um, those kind of guys. And they said, we're all waiting to terminate our private insurance because it's costing them between nine and $11,000 per employee per year, but if they pay the penalty, it's only 4,000. Now, I, I have a Harvard MBA. You guys are at Georgia Tech. Which is better? I'm not too smart. 9000 or 4000 So you can save $5,000 per person. For us, that's $25 million a year. So you're a CEO. You're going to get a big $10 million bonus if you hit the bottom line bogey. You can save $25 million a year. What's the only thing that's keeping them from doing that right now? Bingo. What do they want to be? Second. Second. That's exactly what the chairman of the biggest company in Georgia said. You should give this guy an A for class today because <laughs> it took him five seconds to figure out what every executive in America is thinking. When you do that, these people won't have insurance anymore and they'll have to pay out of their own pocket. And, and actually the insurance exchange will pay them some but I went without a Blue Cross contract for 10 years in, in, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and you'd have your surgery, and we'd bill the patient, and they would send it to Blue Cross, and the bill would be 20,000. Blue Cross would send them 10,000. About half of them would send us 10,000 and say, we don't own any more, and the other half would take that 10,000 and buy an RV. 
I'm not kidding. So, so, so healthcare reform, when everybody's insurance is canceled, because the whole marketplace is written off or built off of that private pay patient. You're a private pay patient. Somebody rich who has good insurance uh, versus Medicaid. <coughs> The other thing that keeps me up at night, and this is more detail probably than you guys want to know, um, doctors are very independent beings. And, and it's sort of like lawyers working in the courthouse, the hospital supplying the courthouse for them. But in the new world, you really need to work as a team. So if you look at the places that are winning, it's uh, the Geisinger Health System. You've heard about Geisinger. And Danville, Pennsylvania has 11,000 people. It's so an hour and a half north of Harrisburg. There is nothing there. But they have an 800-bed hospital with 1,000 doctors. It's the most unbelievable thing because they bring every, everybody in from literally a 300-mile radius. Um, and they're all working together, and they're kicking butt. Um, most hospitals here are trying to get that interaction, like Piedmont's employed... Um, um, a thousand, or I'm sorry, a hundred cardiologists. So they're trying to do it through the employment model. We'll have to get closer to them at night. On the public hospital side, we live off dish. That's buzzwords for federal payments to poor hospitals. That's being reduced 15% um, a year starting in 2014. So I need to get my patients flipped to paying patients because uh, uh, that's 10 million a year for me. So I need to get 10 million of paying patients to make up for the 10 million I'm not going to get. Private hospitals want to have nothing to do with my patients today because they're poor, they're stinky. But in 2014, they'll have an insurance card. Okay, so they're very interested in steel ma'am. In 1990, Medicaid in Georgia didn't pay for OB babies, so Grady did 10,000 of them, and now they pay for them, and Grady does 3,000 of them. So we lost 7,000 deliveries a year. At 2,000 delivery, that's 14 a year. But Medicaid doesn't pay for prenatal care. So we're still doing prenatal care for these poor women. And then they go into labor and they drive to Northside or Crawford Long because it's pretty. But these hospitals, these rich hospitals, won't even do the prenatal care because it would cost them money. Medicare cuts I talked about. And the teaching faculty, the teaching hospital, is, is well behind the normal private hospital and how we get our teachers to think more like innovators instead of just teaching is going to be a challenge. And those are my prepared remarks. Management makes a difference. It makes all the difference in the world. There's no right solution, okay? You have to understand quickly your organization. You have to quickly understand your market and you have to make it work. In a turnaround situation, you can be a crazy guy. In Lancaster, after 18 years of $100 million profits, it was very prim and proper, and I had to be very prim and proper, and we had lots of you know, planning meetings and build team meetings and all that kind of stuff because it was a different focus. But management makes all the difference. Look at Lee Iacocca at Chrysler. Look at Job's at Microsoft. Um, look at the entrepreneurs who turn over their, their, their e-commerce company after three or four years because they just can't manage it. OK? Questions? Michael has a question. And since they made you stand up here and go first, I'll let you go first. How's that? OK? Your question was, um, how, did, how did we do the turnaround at ECMC? Um, Anybody here from the business school? Just so I know. It's really easy. We grew our revenue 14% uh, while our costs only grew 6%. So you can do the math. And we did that four years in a row. So that 8% spread compounded over four years. Um, so we really did it on collections, on operations, on bringing in new patients by changing the image and changing our service culture. So that was a very good question. Who has the next one? Yes. You, oh, okay. um, you were just talking about, um, you, about uh, the uninsured uh, yes. going to private hospitals. First of all, can I, can I be heard? 
Okay. Uh, first of all, what exactly is the danger of losing those patients? What's the real result of that, um, both to you as a company? If they're uninsured, what are the actual losses that the private hospital is suffering from? And then also, what is what are the losses that society at large suffers from these newly insured poor people going to private hospitals? Right. right. Um, and if you could then further expand on your views on uh, the new health care bill in general, I'd be very interested right. to hear that. Um, that's, you ought to give him a star, because that's really a good question, too. We're actually having the discussion, does Grady need to exist? We're actually having that discussion with our board of directors. Can you imagine that? Me, the guy they just brought in to save Grady, says maybe in 2016 we don't need Grady because everybody theoretically will be insured except for the illegal immigrants. That's not a, I'm just a group of people. I'm not making comment. Okay. But in 2014, they'll all have an insurance card. It'll say the President Obama insurance plan. It'll have his picture on the back. And I'm just kidding, but, but they could have fixed the health plan by merely paying the public hospitals. Because guess what? There are no uninsured in Atlanta. There is no one that has no access to care in Atlanta, because where do they have access? Grady, and they've had it for 30 years, and the care is actually good at Grady. But the, the, the politicians had to give them something that they could carry in their wallet. And every time they pulled it out, they would say, Ooh, the Democrats gave this to me. I'm going to vote for them next time around. And if you think it's more than that, and you think it's about caring for people, let me just tell you, I've been in the government healthcare business for six years, um, and, and, and the politicians could care less that Grady was falling down, that the beds were 50 years old, that it didn't meet fire code, that the fire alarm didn't even work. So these are the same people who are telling you they're really caring about those people, um, and they could have fixed it in a heartbeat. So now they're uninsured today. But on January 1st, 2004, they'll have insurance. And just like those, those OB patients, they'll now say, oh, I want to go to Crawford Long or Piedmont or, or Northside. And from a societal perspective, that isn't bad per se. Okay, And Grady can probably close up and go away then so long as those people stay in the system, so long as the system continues to exist. And, 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 and so then we would do what's the best economic savings wind down of Grady. The problem is there's still going to be 25 million people who won't have insurance because uh, they're immigrants, illegal immigrants. Uh, legal immigrants can get a green card, ergo they'll be covered. Uh, and in Georgia, that's 600,000 people. So they'll have a hard time going somewhere. So, so my thought on the health plan is um, um, I actually think universal coverage was the answer. You know, from a Harvard business guy, that sounds a little strange. But the Canadian system really is the best system in the country, except they don't have enough CAT scanners. And I actually have as many CAT scanners at Grady as the city of Toronto does. Um, and so America has plenty of CAT scanners and MRs. And the other problem in Canada was there weren't enough doctors because they set the RVU workload level too low. And they would hit that after six or seven months. And then they didn't get paid anymore to do the next surgery. So do you think they got up at 5 in the morning to go do a surgery they weren't paid for? So what'd they do? They went to California and Florida, and they work locums, tenants, rental doctors for those winter months, got a nice vacation, got paid for it. But now in Canada, they've raised the RVU count and the pay a little bit, and they've kept the doctors. And, and so um, I think the flaw with the new health system um, is the average hospital is not going to be prepared to deal with these really sick, poor people. 75% of my patients have diabetes. Okay. They're used to patients taking their pills. I actually have to send nurses out to these high-risk TB patients and force them to take the pills. And if I don't think they're going to take the pills, I have to lock them in my hospital and make them take the pills. So, so I don't think the average proprietary place can do it. And, and at the end of the day, um, government 
there is, the, the country cannot afford the absolute free healthcare system that we have today where everybody, how many of you guys are driving uh, Lamborghinis? Porsches? Lexuses? Couple, couple Lexuses, okay. Well, why not? It's too expensive, okay. But we, we're giving every patient, I'm giving a guy from Chicago $38,000 worth of chemo drugs because his daughter lives in Cobb County. He just happened to be down visiting when he uh, came out of remission um, and didn't go to Wellstar because they would throw him out. They would, they would treat him as an emergent. Um, and, and so we're going to give him his chemo drugs, OK? So when it's all free like that, everybody will demand a Lamborghini, and that's where we are. Um, all you have to do is walk in any ICU in America, and 75% of the patients in there aren't going to be here in three months. But yet we're spending $15,000 a day to do everything on them. I don't want to make that call as to who gets it and who doesn't, um, but, but I don't think we can afford that. Matter of fact, I know we can't afford it because we're in a mess already. So that's a very good question. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Sabrina. Um, my mother-in-law is a tissue manager at Emory Hospital. And she gave birth to my husband at Grady. Uh, so I thank Grady for the safe delivery. <laughs> good. Um, my question is, um, in what area is Grady doing better than Emory? And what area is Emory doing better than Grady? I know they're kind of two different animals because it's Grady is for profit and Emory is nonprofit, but I was wondering what your answer will be. Um, the big difference between Emory and us is really in the services that we do. We do a lot of primary care services because it's been set up that way over the last 30 years. Is there more money being a family doctor or a neurosurgeon? Neurosurgeon. Um, so they have 30 and we have two. Okay, so over 30 years, the, the primary care stuff, internal medicine, having babies, pneumonias, the non-cardiology, the non-nurse, the non-complex non things were done at Grady where the reimbursements were low. I'm not saying this was planned, but it's mysterious to me. Um, so Emory's really a, a subspecialty quaternary hospital. They're doing very, very high-end stuff. They're not doing gallbladders. They, are, they, they do have an orthopedic hospital, but that's unusual for a teaching hospital. And Grady's doing this primary care stuff. What we do better than them is, 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 is primary care, most notably teaching. Like we have, we teach diabetics what it means to be a diabetic. Here's why you do your insulin levels, you know, yada, yada, yada. So we're much better on that. We just got a gift from uh, Bernie Marcus, the guy who started Home Depot to build a stroke center. It's, uh, we actually plagiarized uh, Emory's stroke center and said, what would you change differently? And we did all those changes. Uh, and so it's now probably, and we recruited a, the young star from Harvard and the young star from Vanderbilt. They've been here about six weeks. So we actually probably do stroke better than anybody in the Southeast right now. And of course, we do trauma a lot better because we do 10 of them every day. So we are good at it after 30 years. But Emory is a great institution. You said that, <clears throat> excuse me, that you, a plan should be concise and from the back of a business card. I was curious about what the plan for Grady was and what it says on the back of your business card. Um, actually, I haven't quite been able to implement that at Grady because I haven't spent um, a lot of time marketing to employees, although I do have sessions like this every month. So we've really made it simple. Our plan is threefold. Step number one was to, to get Grady out of the paper, okay? And, and we titled that Stop the Craziness. And can you imagine me handling, handing to the chairman of Georgia Pacific, who's my board chair, a plan that says step one is stop the craziness. He said, what's this mean? I said, just come over to my house and we'll watch the news and you'll know. And he said, oh, that's right. Okay, so we've achieved that, right? You haven't heard us you know, we don't steal rings from dead people anymore, and <laughs> right? Which was going on before I got here, right? We worked really hard, okay? Goal number two is become a real hospital. And what's a real hospital? 
Uh, and that means we can turn lab tests around in a real period of time. We can get you through the ER in four hours. We can turn around a chest x-ray in four hours up on the floor. And we have explicit measures on that. And then the third step is to, to grow program. And, and number four is to break even. And the way we got to break even, I, I talked to groups like this and I'd say, you know, and they hadn't had a pay increase for three years. So they would all say, well, Mr. Young, when am I going to get my pay increase? And I say, never. I said, I'm never going to give you a pay increase again. And they all went. I said, when we break even and make money, I will pay you pay for performance. But until then, there's no money. I can't grow money out of trees. So all those patients you don't bill, that you could bill, that would have been your pay increase. So mysteriously, last year, we collected 70 million more in cash than we did before. And when the office manager would let his brother come in from free care, the nurse would squeal on him, and we'd bill that guy. OK, so we have it. It's really that simple. It's that four things. Uh, you talked a lot about metrics for like the bottom line or numbers going in and out. Are there any like metrics for patient care, quality of care, like patient happiness at the end of the day? Yeah, there really are. There's about 30 of them, and, and, and most of them are specific to their own area. So, you know, hospital wide ones are length of stay, patient satisfaction, uh, cost per case, but then you look at them in stroke. You know, it's time to the angio suite. In cardiology, it's time to the cath lab, cost per case. In the operating room, it's anesthesia time. How long does it take the doctor to do the case? Number of operative procedures that return to the OR because we didn't fix all the bleeders while you were there one time. Readmissions to the hospital within 15 days. Um, so, so yeah, each area has their own specific one. They were not measured at Grady. And the good news is in Pennsylvania, starting in 1988, the state collected your data and began to publish it. So I could say, they're going to print this in the paper. And the first two years, it's going to be the hospital's name. And the third year, it's going to have your name on it, doctor. And you're going to lose all your business. And oh, by the way, the data that they print is three years old. So you better get working on it now. So the doctors have really been working on it. So we've cut our length of stay from 8 to 5.75. We've cut our operating room turnaround from an hour and 10 minutes to 20 minutes. We've cut our OR, ER throughput from 12 hours to 4 hours. So, so it, we measure this and we pay people based upon the metrics that they hit. The HIEs, health information exchanges, and what role will Grady play in that? Yeah, um, it's interesting. Actually, in Buffalo, we had one of the world's best HIEs. It had been up and running in five years. And my CIO came down from Buffalo. So, so I know all the hospitals want to steal our patients because they're sitting around the table talking about HIE, which is health information exchange for poor people's care. They don't want it working just yet, but they do want it ready to go for 2014 so they can get all those patients. And, and, and I'm not that paranoid, but um, do you think my CIO, who, who's done this before and has the best one in the country in Buffalo, do you think she got that assignment? Do you? Who got that? Which hospital got that assignment? Piedmont. Oh, amazing. He's not even from a health care. He's never done this before. Hmm, very strange. Um, and then it's being run by Emory this little task force, uh, and the other leadership positions on Wellstar. They could have all those patients today if they want them. So it makes me a little skeptical. Um, I, think it's, I, I, I think there's a 15 to 20 percent savings in Medicaid, which is state insurance, by having a health information exchange. Because uh, we have a baby one now, and, and these patients shop ERs nonstop. They go to two or three or four, so they're getting all these x-rays and all this test, number one. And number two, 60% of my patients who are hospitalized don't have a doctor to follow up on. Okay, so anybody ever been in the hospital? Okay, 
So you, 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 you had your gallbladder out or whatever, and then you followed up the next week in the surgeon's office, and then two weeks later you went to your internist, to your family doctor, your pediatrician, right? 60% of my patients don't have a family doctor. So now every time someone's discharged, we Google where they live, and we say, uh, Asa Yancey is the closest clinic for you. We'll get you an appointment tomorrow. So I think uh, health insurance exchanges are critical. This task force is working on one. Um, the state's required to have one. They don't know what day tomorrow is. Um, so, so hopefully the hospital guys can do that. Since they didn't include our CIO, um, and we're turning our information system on in two weeks, we're going to let them choke, you know. <laughs> and, and then they'll say, hey, you did this in Buffalo. Can you tell us what to do? And then we'll be glad to help them out. But since they were a little rude, um, we're going to let them sweat a little bit. Okay. You know, you have to have a little fun in your yeah, job. Yeah, question? 